Happy extended quarantine, people of the planet. I hope the toilet paper and old stowaway of Hormel Completes that you have tucked away in your uh, torture basement are treating you pretty well. Do you guys remember Star Wars? It's kind of a cult IP that not a lot of people know about, but some really love. It's kind of like Tommy Wiseau's The Room. Uh, except the only difference between Tommy Wiseau and George Lucas um, is that Tommy Wiseau has long hair. My friends, surprise, are uh, pretty big Star Wars fans, like apparently the majority of the world, but I'm not. So um, I've decided to uh, lend my heavily critical and uh, superbly biased opinion to one of the greatest IPs that has ever graced this planet and maybe one of the most recognizable franchise names globally. Storage Wars. And like the uh, renowned psychopath that I am, I've decided to go about it in an order that may or may not make you question my opinion going forward just in general. So starting with the prequels, I'm going to make my way chronologically through the cinematic narrative of the Star Wars franchise. And I do specify cinematic because I do not have the time nor patience to watch your silly Cartoon Network show. I don't even care if it's actually good. I had to demean something about this franchise to make myself feel better. Did it work? Kinda. So I'm going to go with it. In addition to the three trilogies, I've included the stories, as I call them, which is kind of like the DLC of the Star Wars universe. So I'm going to go movie by movie, introduce it, put music up, sizzle your senses if you have any left from all the drugs and alcohol you've consumed during this uh, lockdown, and then include a quote of how I'd describe how the movies were described to me by friends throughout the years. Keep up. So without further ado, if you haven't left yet, thank you. And I'm sorry. Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I really wish Liam Neeson was in a Star Wars movie? N no? Oh. Yeah, no, I, I didn't either. I never asked for that. But we got one. And it's about as bad as you can imagine. Also, I'm just going to lob this out there. I haven't watched a ton of movies that were made before 2000. So, like, I'm just really curious. Has Liam Neeson ever been in a good movie aside from widows all right so i just looked it up to make sure that i was right and uh before you guys uh try to you know kill me in the streets i completely forgot about schindler's list i also didn't realize he was in gangs of new york this movie's fun but kind of like in the way that you want to blow your brains out jar jar binks isn't nearly as bad as uh you gentiles made him out to be so if i hear one more bit of slander about him it's on site our two stars for the movie are uh mr niece or the homeboy niece uh if you're not into the whole uh brevity thing and ewan mcgregor otherwise known today as uh, connor mcgregor um they actually happen to be the same person I, I don't know if you guys knew that our two stars hold this movie down like it's tickling them and on top of that the story does pretty much nothing to provide any form of characterization except for the fact that neeson's qui-gon and mcgregor's obi-wan don't just have fucked up names but they have hyphens in them too you know i was told going into the prequels that they sucked because they were super pseudo political dramas that lacked all of the fun of the original trilogy and i'm really happy to report that that isn't true they suck because they're shitty movies it felt like as an entire movie that it was just a dragged out first act of another big movie and then i realized it would have just been a lot better for the franchise if they made episode one two and three its own long movie and maybe made other movies to go with it like if perhaps instead of what we got the prequels were instead episodes one through three is one movie then maybe a live action clone wars movie and then maybe rogue one that would have been pretty cool, but instead we're left with three parts of a much longer and frankly much better movie experience, including this, a two hour plus first act where the only character arcs that seem to happen are forced upon our heroes instead of chosen, which more or less makes them feel non-existent. Obi-Wan's arc is okay, but like... It comes in the wake of tragedy where he's more or less forced into becoming a Jedi Knight. Meanwhile, 
Anakin is just the same kid, except he's on a different planet and he's having pubescent cravings for Amidala. Qui-Gon might be one of my least favorite characters that I've ever come across in any form of entertainment medium ever. He does nothing remotely likable aside from not being an outright dick and scolding Jar Jar for having bad table manners. Dude gets smoked in the end and it's bye bye forever, man. No one cares. The performances also all seem to just suck somehow. I don't quite know why. All except for Frank Oz, of course. The movie did, however, have uh, pretty good imagery at times and I felt the sound design was pretty well done like with most Star Wars movies. So it's uh, safe from the gulag for now. The movie at the end of the day just feels like a uh, first act of a much longer movie that we'll never get to see. So for now, I'm uh, pretty okay with uh, forgetting about this, uh, hopefully forever. The Phantom Menace gets a 4.25 out of 10. His fears older than I. Very cute. Dark curly hair, dreamy eyes. All right, I get the picture. I legitimately hadn't heard anything about this movie prior to viewing it. I probably scrolled over it 15 times before finding it on Disney+. Plus. That's how much I didn't recognize it or identify it. So finally, I had to use my big boy brain and uh, search it on the Disney Plus search engine and finally found uh, episode two, Attack of the Clones. A movie so devoid of a soul that only its cheesiest worst moments are the ones worth remembering. I'm sure that most of you have forgotten by now that the film's pregame to its climax, because of course the script is so devoid of structure in its second half, is a gladiator-esque battle with space animals. Makes me depressed, bro. And the villain, aside from the on-brand narrative setup that's required to watch any of these movies, isn't introduced until, uh, well, until the second half of the story. Oh yeah, and Count Dooku isn't cool or memorable, much like this movie in general. In fact, I think I'm just gonna start calling him Count Poo Poo. Poo Poo may be great in your silly little show, but he's not great here, man. When Poo Poo is first introduced to us, it seems as if he's gonna be this conflicting type villain where our main heroes are gonna be conflicted and dispatching him because he's breaking it to them that the Republic is being compromised or is compromised but what fucking sense does that make if he's part of the group that's compromising it why does he is he just trying to lie to him to get him to join the fucking separatist movement at what point would that do then he, they'll just realize they're cis that the plan doesn't make sense i don't get it man maybe one of you fucking guys can explain it to me like wouldn't it just make a lot more sense if poo poo didn't say anything because they're jedis they might get fucking free like i feel like if poo poo just said nothing the jedi council would be far less suspicious of palp Palpatine and Anakin wouldn't be so pissed off in the next movie when they ask him to spy on Palpatine. It got really dark, so I probably just got really dark right there. Don't fucking care. Fucking. I, they, they, these just suck balls, guys. They, they suck balls. How's that? Is that better? I turned up the ISO so it lets in more light. Probably gonna look like some fucking Momo. The only somewhat interesting arc I felt in this movie was that of Jango Fett, but even then it just, just kind of feels like he's a hired gun that just got in the way. It doesn't really do much to establish why he thinks the way he does or why he behaves the way he does. And again, I'm not gonna read a fucking comic book. I've screamed a lot in this segment of the video. My mom's gonna think I'm actually getting mad. Anakin losing Shmi and then going on a rampage is a great idea that's essentially thrown away for nothing. Anakin tells the love of his life that he fucking killed children and she doesn't really seem to react any other way than consoling him for being sad. It's like, does that shit matter at all? He fucking killed like a whole fucking pack of people, women and kids. Nothing? All right, whatever. I'm watching that scene where he starts like rubbing her back. It's so creepy. Anakin losing his mother and the personal blame for leaving her vulnerable like surge through his veins more than anyone who has ever tried to become a Jedi before. And they don't really explain why. I guess I'm just confused why Anakin is the chosen one while wow is the chosen one while simultaneously being an unsa unstable being an unstable maniac. There's probably some bullshit fucking lore that I haven't seen yet or read yet or fucking played yet or some stupid shit like that. But it just really feels like Qui-Gon should have just listened to Yoda in episode one and fucking left Anakin on the side of the road. And maybe that's the whole point of the story is that it's an unfortunate tragedy or destiny's paved with pain. I don't know. The fact that I'm thinking about it this much really bums me out. I've actually forgotten what movie I was trying to review at this point. Here we have another movie with little to nothing to invest emotionally in 
and a cast that's more interested in what the Star Wars name will do for their careers than actually how they appear in the movies. So, yeah, that's my Rotten Tomatoes one-liner. All except for uh, Frank Oz and Christopher Lee, man. I'm going to go ahead and give Attack of the Clones a 4.25 out of 10. Hopefully I'll never have to see you again. I was right. The Jedi are taking over. The oppression of the Sith will never return. You have lost. No. Now we move on to the movie I saw as a nine-year-old without any prior Star Wars viewing whatsoever. Revenge of the Sith has the feel of Infinity War, but with the stakes of Endgame, and that's a really cool combo. I really like dropping into movies right as things start to go downhill for characters, because what better motif is there than suffering? I'm sure it'll come as no surprise when I say that this is that third act of that bigger and better movie we never got. Unlike the last two movies, this really seems to have a backbone to it. Like Lucas really provides a useful articulation of story structure and it's for better or worse, the best script in the prequel trilogy. Does it stand on its own though? Absolutely the fuck not. Prequels are so frustrating in that everyone's character arcs are completed in this movie. Like all, like I understand that like some characters have a grand arc there's pretty much been no fucking arc in the last two for anyone you know it's like it does it just it's just it's just really annoying man i'm really fucking annoyed in attack of the clones it more or less sets up anakin's disdain towards the jedi by having him slowly start to uh, distrust obi-wan but then at the end he just chooses to side with obi-wan as if he didn't have those thoughts and they think that that's the grand arc that they can split into two movies and it had no fucking payoff back there. So it was fucking useless. I can't help but feel that if your character is conflicted at the end of your movie, then his arc is not complete, which is why this movie is so satisfying because he goes from the confliction to actually making a choice that'll change his life and a lot of others forever. Palpatine's arc was finished finally as well. I'm less critical about Palpatine's arc lasting all three movies because he was just really on the sidelines the whole time. Obi Obi-Wan learns that a lot of things don't go how we wish and that a lot of us have to make some really tough choices for the greater good. And I mean tough, like some really tough choices, like turning your back on your younger brother. And that's good shit. But we waited two movies for him to learn anything. Oh, and Padme loses hope and dies. Changes and decisions that the characters make in this movie actually happen when they should, and it all kind of has coherence to it, and for once, I've watched a Star Wars movie that didn't make me want to hang myself. However, the cast uh, happens to be ass. Hayden Christensen might just be one of the worst actors to ever grace a franchise. Natalie Portman clearly doesn't care. Ewan McGregor, I can't blame him, wants to get back into the uh, MMA ring, obviously. And then Sam Jackson delivers one of the worst death screams I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> um, it's taken me the two weeks that it's taken for me I guess that makes sense to realize that I'm reviewing Star Wars movies and I'm scruffy and I'm wearing hockey jerseys and I'm high. And I still have the sense of humor of a 10 year old. I just kind of realized I'm fucking Kevin Smith, man. Ian McDiarmid is great though. And so is Christopher Lee with what little time he had and Frank Oz as always. They can't however make up for some very, very serious scenes that are acted so poorly they're like parody. And also for a 2006 movie, the uh, CGI is uh, pretty bad. I do feel like Lucas, however, reintegrated some visual storytelling into Revenge of the Sith, which was a crazy breath of fresh air from Attack of the Clones. And like the rest of these, the sound is very... <coughs> and like the rest of these movies, the sound is done very fucking well. This was by far and wide my favorite of the prequels that just, I feel like, happened to be acted horribly and contain some pretty shitty effects. I was skeptical about watching the prequels first, but now I'm pretty glad that I did because whenever I see Vader, like in future movies, a la Rogue One, I don't really just see the Grim Reaper. I see like a damaged kid too weak to handle the misery of life and... I'm actually pretty grateful for that. Revenge of the Sith earns itself a 6.25 out of 10. If that's too low for you nerds, jump off a bridge. So if you add it up on average, the prequels get a 4.9 out of 10, which I'll put in that graphic somewhere right there. Oh yeah. 
it's a good placement for it. I'm not even shitting. This took me like two weeks to record, so I'm hoping it doesn't take me another two weeks to uh, record the next bit. Because next I'll be doing the stories, and the stories aren't that bad. The stories are pretty fine. The stories are fine, but we'll get there. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sitting through it, and Black Lives Matter.